Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. And joining us today is Christopher Fryman. He's an associate professor of philosophy at William & Mary. His new book is Unequivocal Justice. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thank you. Your book begins with a striking claim. You write, the very reasons why the state is needed are reasons why the state won't work. What do you mean by that? So I'll give you a simple case. So a standard argument that you see from economists and political philosophers as for why we need the state points to a public goods problem. So take something like clean air. They say we need the state to coercively enforce clean air laws. Maybe that's through carbon taxes or a cap and trade scheme or something like that. You say, well, why won't people just uh, do the right thing voluntarily? So why won't they buy – uh, hybrids voluntarily? Why won't they install solar panels, panels on their own? And the answer is, well, their individual contribution to clean air is insignificant. So even if you buy a Prius, even if you put solar panels on the top of your house, that's not going to make a meaningful dif uh, difference as to whether or not the atmosphere is clean or not. And what's more, if other people are actually cleaning up their acts and driving Priuses and putting solar panels on their houses, you can free ride off of this. And so no individual has an incentive to voluntarily, let's say, buy a Prius. So we have this horrible air pollution problem and we're all worse off. And so the uh, this public goods problem is a justification for the state. We need the state to force people to contribute to this public good of clean air. That's the justification for the state in the first place. But if we take seriously this free rider problem, then we see that the state that's introduced as a solution to the public goods problem is it is uh, also subject to a, a free rider worry. So this is the standard kind of public choice analysis of voting. Uh, you're asking yourself whether or not you should cast an informed vote, an intelligent vote, a vote for good governance. And you say, well, my casting a vote is not actually going to affect the outcome of the election. The odds of that happening are beyond infinitesimal. Meanwhile, if other people are casting good votes, votes for good governance, you can just free ride off of that. So if other people elect a really good president, you get all the benefits of that president without casting the vote yourself. And so the very same incentives that cause the public goods problem that allegedly creates the need for a state is also going to have this kind of boomerang problem or when we're trying to devise a just and efficient state, we can't get it because people are looking to free ride on the contributions to the state itself. And how is this related to another important distinction in your book and something that's discussed a lot in political philosophy, ideal versus non-ideal theory? Right. So ideal theory is this term coined by Rawls. And he means different things by it in different places. But the, the meaning that I focus on in the book is what you might think of as ideal institutional theory. So he says, let's theorize about institutions for a perfectly just society made up of people who are more or less fully compliant with justice. So sometimes he'll say that we assume everybody complies with justice. Other times he'll say nearly everybody complies with justice. But that's, I think, uh, not, not a huge issue. The main idea is just what, what does government look like in a world of nothing but just people? Uh, Non-ideal theory takes the problem of injustice more seriously where it says, look, um, what kind of institution should we have for people who can be corrupted, who might be short-sighted, who might be selfish and so on? And Rawls thinks both are important, but he thinks that we need to do ideal theory uh, for a variety of reasons. One thing, we might just care about what the ideal society looks like, but we might also need ideal theory as a way of giving us a target for real world institutions to aim at. Uh, my objection to ideal theory is that a society of fully just people is actually a society that has no need for the state. So if you think of the state as a, a an institution that has a monopoly on coercion, you might ask, why do people need a state if they're willing to fully comply with justice just out of the goodness of their heart? So you say, look, if people are fully ideal, then they will just drive the Prius without having uh, you know, laws mandating it or something like that because they care about doing the right thing. And so my argument is that uh, when Rawls is doing ideal theory, he actually kind of shuffles back and forth between ideal and non-ideal assumptions. So in a truly ideal world – 
we have anarchy because people are doing the right thing under the goodness of their heart and you don't need the state uh, threats of incarceration and so on to motivate them to do the right thing. Um, so to give the state a, a function, to give the state a job to do, what you'll see is Rawls actually assuming people acting in non-ideal ways in non-political contexts. So in the marketplace, they're not going to buy the Prius. And so we have the problem of air pollution. In civil society, they're not going to donate enough to charity. So we have a need for some sort of state reinforced redistribution, uh, state enforced redistribution. And so this, I argue, leads to this kind of biased analysis where he says, uh, we need the state to be active in regulating the economy and redistributing income because look at all these problems that arise in the non-political world because people aren't doing the right thing. But I argue that this is um, – sort of an unfair and frankly uninteresting way of analyzing institutions. If you're comparing perfect governments to imperfect markets, imperfect civil society, that's not really a fair comparison. It's not really an interesting comparison if we're trying to figure out what the right balance should be in the real world. And my argument is essentially if you're doing full ideal theory, that's fine. That's cool. You can do that if you want. But then we're talking about some kind of ideal anarchy. If we want to think about a world in which political institutions actually have a point, you have to do full-fledged non-ideal theory. And this means taking the non-compliance of political actors seriously as well. So we can't assume in the way that Rawls does that voters, bureaucrats, politicians, and so on will comply with justice. We have to assume they're subject to the same limitations, the same incentives as everybody else. It seems though that we can think of reasons why we might need a state that don't have to do with perfect justice versus injustice, right? That, so as you said, like if, if everyone was perfectly just, we wouldn't need a state. So the question of what kind of state we have in a perfectly just world is moot. But states fill other roles. You mentioned this with the, the public goods prior, but also like coordination problems, information, perfectly just people, you know, may not have as much information as someone whose job it is to sit at the center and have all that information. And so is there is there still a role for talking about it in those regards, even if we're assuming away injustice elsewhere? Yes. So I think that's an important point. Uh, and I, I talk about that a bit in the book. And so my argument is, this, is, is fairly modest. So I want to argue that for those sorts of problems where you think even morally perfect people might have a need for government, I'm, I'm open to that possibility. But the problem is the very same reasons why morally perfect people might have problems providing public goods, coordinating, et cetera, et cetera, are all also going to be reasons to think that morally perfect people might still get dysfunctional government. So for example, I'm completely open to the argument that you can have public goods problems even among people who are perfectly just. And I think this is something that, that Rawls himself uh, considered. So the idea is not that you are driving the polluting SUV because you're a bad person. It's because you don't want to have your own efforts exploited. So Rawls talks about conditional cooperation. The idea is I'm happy to contribute my fair share to the environment so long as everybody else is doing the same. And that's why we need the state. We need the state to make sure that everybody is doing their fair share. It's not really a deficit of morality. It's just we, we you know, uh, don't want to have our own contributions exploited. We'll cooperate conditional on other people cooperating as well. But the argument that I make in the book is if that's a problem in non-political contexts, it's equally a problem in political contexts. So I might say, look, uh, I am more than happy to cast a uh, high information, low biased vote for the best political candidate. But I'm only willing to do that if I have some sort of guarantee that other citizens, other voters are doing the exact same thing. In the absence of that guarantee, I'm either going to sit home on election day and not cast a vote at all, or I will cast a vote, but I won't do my research or I'll do my research but process it in a very uh, biased way. So I think if we're if if we're worried about producing good outcomes in non-political contexts because people aren't willing to give unreciprocated contributions, that's going to be equally a problem when we're talking about contributions to the state. And I think that's actually what we see. Uh, I think when we see people, uh, you know, something like uh, I don't know, half of uh, eligible voters don't vote. Uh, the information of voters is extremely low, and even high information voters are extremely biased. Uh, I don't know if that's due to a moral failing. That just might be how they're responding to the incentives. You said that ideal theory is a coin coinage of Rawls. Yes, and it's sort of interesting because I see the point of saying, okay, what is the what are we shooting at? Let's imagine what the just society looks like. And it's kind of like 
economics or physics, a frictionless universe of physics. You figure out where the ball is going to go perfectly and then you add a noise and adjust your throw accordingly. But you know you want to hit it in the right. in the target. But it's also kind of interesting because I'm trying to think of before Rawls. I mean, he coined the term, but but m political theorists like Locke or Hobbes or Mill or even Marx to some extent were talking about real world human institutions. Right. I mean, or you go read like the opposite of Rawls for ideal theory would be like James Madison. I'm a constitutional lawyer, so you're, like everything in the Federalist Papers That's right. is people are not going to be perfect. People are you know we cannot we have to plan to eliminate or control vice, and this is what our institutional design is about. And then what results is going to be just kind of like Rawls, but not but but using the input of bad people right. as the given. So is it kind of just completely out of nowhere that Rawls comes up with this idea? Yeah, we're going to pretend that everyone is perfect, and then, and then now we're all talking about it, just like we're always talking about Rawls to this day. <laughs> but now we have another reason to do it. I certainly think that the fact that Rawls talked about it a lot uh, is a reason why we're still talking about it today. So I, I'm not sure if I would say Rawls got it out of nowhere, but I think it is a, a very sharp departure from the way that political philosophy and political economy was was done prior to Rawls or in the history of political economy. Because you're exactly right. You look at people like. Smith, for example, and this is you know Smith's idea of uh, you know sort of the invisible hand, where you have people pursuing their own self interest, and then the question is how do we arrange institutions so that self interest will lead to socially beneficial outcomes? So yeah, I agree. I think Rawls uh, is definitely his methodology is at odds with the way that political theory and political uh, philosophy has been done for a very long time, and I should say I, I certainly think that one of the jobs of political philosophy might be to provide us with a target that we're, we're trying to aim at. But I would advocate for a separation of something like the first principles of justice on the one hand, and that's a philosophical question. So what, what do we want our institutions ultimately to do? So Rawls would say, we want our economic institutions to make the rich as poor as possible. Okay, that sounds pretty good to me. And then you have questions of institutional design, which are basically, okay, so how do we do that? So what sort of institutions will actually maximize the income of the poor? My view is the first set of questions, that's philosophy. We can talk about that as philosophers. The second set of questions is not philosophical. It's for social scientists, economists, uh, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm perfectly happy saying we as philosophers need to have this debate about what the first principles of distributive justice are. But once we figure out what they are, if we figure out what they are, suppose it is the Rawlsian difference principle, we make the poor as rich as possible, then we hand the job over to economists and political scientists and say, OK, now how do we get there? Now I'm out of my element. This is a job for empirical social science. That seems like philosophers – I mean your book has a good amount of, of – Touches on a lot of empirical social science questions, uh, but in general, I don't see political philosophers going to really get into growth rates, uh, for example, or uh, occupational licensing. You know, all these kind of nitty gritty. As so that's not political philosophy, but I can still theorize about the whole world knowing nothing about it, or at least knowing no, little to no economics, uh, and create a perfect system of the why this will work or won't work. That, that's right, and this is something too that. Um, I, I criticize Rawls for so in his later work, he says we can imagine different types of ideal regimes. So you have uh, – he calls it the system of natural liberty, which is essentially libertarianism. He has welfare state capitalism, uh, liberal socialism, command and control socialism, property owning democracy. And he says, OK, I'm going to analyze these in ideal theory a priori. And he argues that he can actually rule out all forms of capitalism as inconsistent with his principles of of justice from the armchair. So he says, I, if we're assuming that institutions uh, work exactly as designed and people are fully compliant with justice, then capitalism is more or less off the table. And part of his argument for that is, well, uh, libertarianism, for example, at most advocates for uh, a very low social minimum. And so that's not going to be good enough by the lights of Rawlsian justice. And since we assume that institutions always produce the outcomes at which they aim and don't produce the outcomes at which they don't aim, capitalism doesn't do the job. And I argue that this is just not a fair way to evaluate institutional uh, regimes. And so, I mean, maybe he's right. Maybe as an empirical matter of fact, capitalism won't do the job. I disagree with him on that. Uh, but it's just not a philosophical question. For listeners who aren't 
that familiar with Rawls then, this this distinction that you made a moment ago, philosophers can kind of look at this like end state. We can look at these principles of justice like that's that's the role of philosophers. But when they start getting into institutional design, that's where they run into problems. What specifically kinds of institutional designs is Rawls aiming at? Because the the, the thumbnail sketch of him is, you know, we we put the people behind the veil of ignorance, and they've got a handful of principles they've got to stick to, um, and they come up with these things. But it's it's kind of a it's a decision making procedure as opposed to an end state like we need a Department of Agriculture. So what what kind of work is he doing? And when people, because you're not, I mean. This book is is against Rawls, but it's really against Rawlsianism, which is f still fairly dominant in the academy. Like, are are the people are the followers of Rawls sticking to the discussions of principles and decision making procedures, or is there really kind of a Rawlsian set of very specific institutions that everyone endorses. I don't have so much of a problem with the original position as a as a decision procedure for figuring out what justice requires. So you say I, that actually strikes me as, as pretty good. I don't know if I would sign on to it completely, but the idea that look, we ask ourselves what kind of principles we would want to be governed by if we didn't know who we are. It seems like this is a pretty good way of getting at impartial results. So that I'm, I'm okay with. Like I said, I'm not sure if I would wholly endorse it, but I don't have much of a problem. My problem comes in sort of with – this is, I think shows up more and more uh, in the later work of Rawls where he says, OK, we have these two principles of justice and we can fill in the details in a particular way. So we want to make sure that people's basic liberties are protected by which he basically means the standard sort of civil liberties. And then we have these economic principles about fair opportunity and again, maximizing the income of the poor. And he comes off that a little bit. Maybe it's just sufficient income, but we'll, we'll put that to the side. And he says, here are the institutions, at least in ideal conditions that are needed to realize these. Well, to ensure that everybody has equal access to the political process, we need to have campaign finance regulations. Uh, to That's very specific. <laughs> yes, no, ex exactly. That's right. And, and maybe there's just, uh, you know, one or two footnotes about, uh, about the particulars, right? So we need campaign finance. Uh, we need pretty uh, robust amounts of redistribution and regulation of the economy to ensure equality of opportunity. And like I said, maybe he's right about that, but that's not really a philosophical question. And so if, if Rawls or Rawlsians just kind of stuck uh, at the level of first principle where they said, we're just trying to figure out what just principles of uh, distribution would look like. And then we hand it off to the empirical social scientist to tell us how to get there. I'd be totally happy with that. It's when Rawls starts saying, we got to have campaign finance regulation. We got to have uh, robust regulation and redistribution of income that I say he's he's kind of stepping out of his element. And you know, the campaign finance case, I think, is actually a good illustration of the problem, which is if people are perfectly just, uh, why are they attempting to buy up unfair shares of political power in the first place? It seems to me in a truly ideal world, uh, nobody would be trying to buy more political power than they're entitled to. So what Rawls does, again, is he sneaks in a bit of uh, non-ideal theory to generate this problem why we would need campaign fin finance uh, regulation. But then when he's considering uh, campaign finance regulation as a solution, he just assumes that it works and doesn't really take into consideration that it could make the the problem even worse. Does this critique of basically ideal theory doing institutional design apply to the – it seems to be less thriving now but once thriving genre of anarcho-capitalist <laughs> literature where you know we we start with principles of justice which are you know very very strong personal and property rights um and then we write chapters and chapters upon how protection agencies might evolve and might work and how we might build roads and so on like would you would you say that's also wrong headed that's an interesting question it might be wrong headed but for Maybe for a different reason. So, so my major problem with Rawlsian ideal theory is the the sort of shuffling back and forth between ideal and non-ideal to suit suit his purposes. So we're going to be non-ideal, uh, like I said, when it comes to charitable donations, because if people gave enough to charity voluntarily, you wouldn't need the welfare state. So we just have to have uh, insufficient charity in the the private sector to generate a need for the state. And then once we got the state up and running, we're just going to assume that it works perfectly. So that to me is my main concern. I do think there's 
a problematic strain of ideal theory among some libertarians where they, they start stipulating uh, you know, about how things are going to work in this really far off society where we have competing protection agencies, et cetera, et cetera. I, my worries there might be more, I don't know, Hayekian or something like that, where it's just really, really hard to know how that would turn out. So I think maybe we need more epistemic humility about those sorts of questions. I'm not sure it involves the kind of uh, shuffling that that uh, Rawls is guilty of, but it might be a problem for a different sort of reason. This is a because I do campaign finance work here at Cato, and so I've thought a lot about these issues. And when you mentioned the campaign finance, would, they, would in Rawlsian institutional design, would they design the campaign finance rules after they would do it after the pr principles have been right. discovered? It'd be at some point of later, right? Uh, because one of the things what we and this goes to your point of your book that we always bring up here at Cato on campaign finance is that you can't expect elected representatives to fairly make the rules by which elected representatives get elected. Right. Right. You, you almost need an original position where it's like before we even have an election, let's agree on fair rules and then we'll all – we don't know what party we're going to be in or who's going to get money and then we'll all have that election right. uh, to, to do it. Well, it's like setting up civilian review boards for police officers. It's yeah. Like you don't want the cops coming up with the rules that cops follow. Exactly. And we, we get that and I would wager that most – your colleagues in philosophy departments would get that. Right. But that gets but to the point. But it seems different of, with the state. Well, that gets to the point of this behavioral symmetry. And I, I, that's important we bring out those words where if I just sort of said, well, look, like if I assume that elected representatives are not perfect and just like in, or whatever I assume about group A, you know, I should assume about group B. Uh, uh, if, if I'm, unless I have some compelling reason to believe right. that state actors are temperamentally or categorically different in terms of their goals, aims, interests, and ideals than they would be in the market. But if you say people are greedy, therefore we need a state, you to, your, your first question is, well, then they're greedy in the state. Right. Exactly. And so uh, if memory serves, I, I think the first use of the term behavioral symmetry was uh, from a book by uh, James Buchanan and Jeff Brennan. And, and right. So basically the idea is unless you have some really good reason to think that people are fundamentally different in one institutional context than another, you should assume that they're subject to the same sorts of motivations and, and limitations. So right. So if you think people are uh, selfish or short-sighted or corruptible or, or whatever in their non-political lives, then the default presumption has to be that they're the same way in, in their political lives. And now certainly I think there are cases where um, – uh, the assumption of behavioral symmetry has got to be false. So, for example, when I'm interacting with my family, it's just very different from the way I interact with, uh, I don't know, somebody that, uh, yeah, colleagues or, you know, a store I'm shopping at or something like that. Uh, but in the case of uh, sort of political life versus non-political life, I talk a little bit about this towards the end of the book. There's not really a compelling empirical reason to think that people are, are uh, motivated by different considerations. There's one exception to that, uh, which I can say a little bit about. Um, but right, the, the idea is with campaign finance, uh, it could turn out to, in fact, benefit uh, people who are already privileged and powerful. So if there are hefty fines for failing to properly comp comply with the campaign finance regulation. They, and there are. Yeah, that's right. It's like, who, who's that going to help? That's going to help the big guy. That's not going to help the little guy. And again, you know, it's an empirical question as to, to what the, the total effect is. But we can't just say from the philosopher's armchair uh, that uh, campaign finance reform is necessary for justice. It might be, but that's not for philosophers to say. Does democracy solve this problem somewhat? That yes, like on average, you know, we humans are fallible. We've got these problems. We can't assume away poor motivations, greed, all those things just across the board. But but it is also the case that some of us are more publicly minded than others. Some of us are more moral than others. You know, all, all of us are, are morally imperfect beings, but we are even in our imperfection or say capable of pointing at people who are like moral role models. Like this is someone who is better than me and I can aim at. And so doesn't a election uh, – and this sounds – Silly sitting in 2019 America right now, but, but just just bear with me. Doesn't an election enable us to say, okay, it's not like we're just picking random people. Right. We're picking people who we chose to take on these roles and so presumably we can pick those kinds of people who we think are better than the median. Right. So I, I think my major worry about that line of argument is, is just the problem that the public choice theora, theorists have been talking about for a long time uh, with rational ignorance and, and rational irrationality, to use Brian Kaplan's term. Uh, so, for example, 
so this actually goes to the point about the, where I do think there is a difference between market behavior and political behavior. Uh, I think the prevailing view, which uh, it, it strikes me as completely correct about political behavior is that it's largely expressive. So when people, let's just take the case of voting, when people are voting, they're engaging in identity expressive behavior. So you vote for a particular candidate because I'm on team Republican and that's what team Republicans do. I vote for this candidate because I'm on team Democrat. This is what Democrats do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think there is a dimension of public spiritedness in, in that uh, because I do think that even political partisans, uh, but maybe on some level, think that they're doing what's best for the, the public good. The problem is because their vote is so insignificant, since it's not going to make a difference to the outcome of the election, there's no incentive, one, to acquire information that might uh, correct any false beliefs they have. So you know, there's all this evidence that most voters have no idea what, what they're voting for what policy is like, and there's no incentive for them to acquire that information. And what I think is maybe even more troubling with that is, than that is just there's no incentive to try to counteract our own partisan biases. So you can present people with as much information as you want, but we engage in this identity protective reasoning where we just really don't want to hear stuff that tells us that we're wrong, and we can process it in a way that enables us to affirm our partisan identity. So I think even if there is this element of public spiritedness when people cast a vote, it's not actually going to track the public interest, whatever that may be, because we're not really trying to get at the public interest. What we're trying to do is express our identity as Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Socialists, what have you. I, one part I really liked about the book was – so you kind of – you know, you zero out if, if Rawls is going to play perfect government versus imperfect market actors. Let's try and play the game with imperfect imp imperfect and see what we get. And one of the things you point out is that one of Rawls's big concerns and and not just Rawls just modern liberalism is is inegalitarianism based on either luck uh, or or which could be inheritance for example or you happen to have the publishing rights to Elvis Presley's songs because you're his great great granddaughter or something or you're just natural inequalities for being a better speaker, a bit more savvy, more better athlete. Those things are not your fault. Uh, but if we're going to play non-ideal versus non-ideal, uh, then we have to ask the question of how would the if you're how would the people who are or have those kind of lucky endowments game the system? Right. Uh, it, they would be really good at politics uh, right. because they have these endowments. So, so you create a political system to redistribute their endowments or the effects of their endowments. But the people who are going to be really good at the political system are actually the people who are supposed to be in charge of the re redistributing. That's right. So you have a problem there. That's right. And, and to me, I think this is, this is a really big gap in liberal egalitarian political philosophy where you say, look, we have these people that, that you know, they have all the luck in the world. They're fortunate. They have wealthy parents. Uh, they know how to work the system. They went to private schools. They went to Harvard. They went to Yale. And they're basically running the show. And how do we keep these people in check? Well, we empower the state to keep them in check. And you say, OK, well, who is actually going to gain control of the state that you empowered to check the rich and powerful? It's probably the rich and powerful. And that's not- Not if I, we have campaign finance reform. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but yeah, they'll keep their hands off camp the campaign finance laws. Yeah, out of a sense of duty. That's yes. right. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I mean, you look at some of the statistics on this about, you know, the backgrounds of people who gain political power. And yeah, I mean, they, they come from wealthy health, households. They went to private schools. They went to Harvard and Yale. I think uh, so this, this statistic, uh, I'm off the top of my head, but something like since 1972, uh, only like one or two major party candidates for the presidential election did not go to Harvard or Yale. And again, that's I mean, that's what you would expect. You have lots of power and the people who are really good at gaming the system get the power that uh, you give you give to the system. But, but it's not I mean, I, I think it, it's not just gaming the system. I mean, if you are much a better rhetoric, right. more agreeable, right, right? Quicker, more funnier, right? The kind of stuff that makes someone a good candidate or be, better able to be, be a businessman or thing. It's just, is that gaming the system? Right. That's just being yourself and then getting – people like to, to appreciate you and getting power because of it. It's also that's probably right. likely to increase your chances of getting into Harvard and Yale. Yeah. And, and that too, yes. Yeah. No, I think that's exactly right. Right. So the qualities that might make you a uh, successful lawyer or very successful in business, you're very energetic, you're extroverted, you're very smart, et cetera. Right. If, if you want to turn those tools to political ends, uh, you probably could do that 
pretty easily. Yeah. The the one thing I was wondering though, you you I can't tell if you're just I mean, mostly you're just arguing here in a book about let's not a not a positive argument for for capitalism being incorrect, but an argument about inconsistency, right. especially in Rawls. Right. Uh, but if if this, we see the system has been game, gamed possibly in the way we've discussed by the rich. Why is the tax code so out of whack? I mean, well, I mean, we have one percent. The top one percent pay thirty-seven percent of the federal income tax, or the top ten percent pay about not, about fifty percent of it, and, and basically top bottom fifty pay nothing. Yeah. Uh, if they gamed it that much, then you would expect otherwise. Or it could be the case that they're actually voting in a very public. Even the rich are voting in a very publicly minded, non non selfish way that they think they should be taxed more too. So their behavior is not exactly as as sort of venal as you imply. That, that's interesting. And, and so this goes to the the possible difference between motivations and politics and non. On political domains. So this is something that uh, Lauren Lamaskey and Jeff Brennan uh, first talked about a long time ago. They talked about expressive voting. And the idea is, so we mentioned this earlier, that when you go to the voting booth, you're not really motivated by material considerations exactly because that would just be irrational. So maybe one of the candidates will ultimately um, uh, lower your taxes or something like that. So maybe uh, if that candidate get, got elected, you would be $1,000 richer, for example. Um, but the odds of your vote actually leading to the election of that candidate are, are nothing. They're basically zero. And so it doesn't make any sense to be worrying about your personal material gains from the election of a candidate. What it might make sense to care about is like the the, the sort of moral expression, the expression of identity that you can make in the voting booth. Like you're, you're waving the flag. You've got your... Uh, don't tread on me license plate kind of thing, which always struck me as weird. You're paying the government to protest the government. That's, I don't know. That's not, but yeah. And, and so it, it, the, the material uh, effect of your vote is basically zero, but the expressive effect effect is non-zero. Uh, and so by contrast in the market, it might be that there are forms of behavior that have higher expressive value, but they're materially costlier. So I think the example I give in the book is you know, like the uh, you're, you're seen walking around with a Whole Foods bag that has expressive value in some social cir circles, but it's more expensive to shop at Whole Foods uh, than Walmart, for example. So you'll probably see less people, less indulgence in expressive behavior in non-political contexts. whereas in political context, that's basically the only value you can get. So we'll probably see lots of expressive behavior. And so it could be the case, right, that what you see are rich people uh, performing these identity expressive actions to signal their concern for the poor, social welfare, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which might mitigate some of the concerns about self-interest. I mean, so, yeah, not to get too into the details, but I think, I mean, there are always questions about uh, you know loopholes and how the laws play out and practice, but I'm certainly open to the, the claim uh, that people are not uh, wholly altruistic or wholly self-interested in the market or in politics. Uh, I actually think it's probably probably the case that we're a mix of both. You just want them to play fair when they're analyzing both sides. That's right. So the question is, if you think people are somewhat altruistic and somewhat self-interested, which seems right to me, uh, hold that behavioral assumption constant across institutional contexts and then see which kind of institution produces the best sort of outcome. I think it's actually the case, though, that markets will do a better job of channeling altruistic behavior than politics for the same sort of reason of, of rational ignorance. So if you're an altruistically mind, minded citizen, Suppose it turns out that the government spends its redistributive dollars very inefficiently, which in fact it does. You can't do anything with that information. You can cast a vote for change, but again, that vote won't actually change anything, so you have no incentive to do your research. On the other hand, if you're spending your own money and you learn that a charity that you're giving money to is acting really inefficiently, you have decisive control over that money. You can withdraw it from that charity and give it to a charity that's more efficient, so you have more incentive to do your research. So my view, and I don't really go into this in the book, is that even if we have this more optimistic picture of human behavior where people are charitable, it's still probably going to be the case that markets do a better job funneling that to socially desirable ends. It seems too though that the example that Trevor brought up and then your discussion of expressive voting and that expressive voting can be you – know, we can take these high-minded principles and act on them in this expressive way can be looked at as – further evidence for your concerns about the state? Because what you're basically saying is here's an example, um, people doing 
good stuff in an expressive way when they're voting where it's basically costless to them. Um, and so the the argument then is people will behave more morally, more on principle, especially in ways that would undercut their own interests if that undercutting is as minimal as possible or the likelihood of it happening, which is the case with voting, is you know, much, much smaller. Um, and so if that's true, then what we would expect is the closer someone gets to being in the state because again, the state isn't just institutions acting, it's individual people in those institutions. As the decisions that they're making, which when you're you know, controlling an industry, uh, an administrative agency that's overseeing an industry or you're making decisions about who to hire or you're overseeing a police department and it's who to fire, these are become much more costly. We're more likely to see people drift back into the self-interested Example, especially because if you don't act self-interestedly, your competitor will. So I talk about this a little bit in the book, but you could imagine this is sort of a broadly Hayekian point about why the worst get on top. You say, look, suppose you, there are, there are angels out there who will always play fair, who will you know never take private donations. They only care about the public welfare, et cetera, et cetera. If we live in a society where most of the voters are rationally uninformed, that person, their angelic nature, will not be fully appreciated by the electorate. And somebody who's willing to to not play fair will beat them. Uh, I'm sure that's how Hillary Clinton feels, by the way. Her angelic <laughs> nature right. is not properly appreciated by the electorate. That's right. Yeah, you just you so you lose to the person who's willing to play dirty. Yeah, exactly. And so it could be that so so Hume has this great line where he says something like, even though it's not really true, we should think as though everybody is a knave in politics. And I think that's right. So you might have genuinely good people in politics, but they uh, have to at least play the game as if they are uh, not great or else they you know won't win, won't win the election for example uh, and I think you see this with things like uh, you know short-sighted social spending you could have a super uh, prudent and patient politician who says look this is going to be really painful uh, but we've got to tighten the belt for the next eight years uh, and then when I leave office he'll be in a much better position that person will lose to the person who says no there's no problem uh, here he, you know here's all this great stuff I can do in the short term I can cut taxes and raise spending and you know there'll be lots of benefits for you uh, that person will probably win over the prudent candidate. And so either the prudent candidates will start to act imprudently or the imprudent candidates will just sort of by evolutionary mechanism select out the prudent ones. If so talking about non-ideal versus non-ideal, I was very glad to see your chapter on growth because it's one of these things that I wrote about in my Rawls class in undergrad that you so Rawls allows inequalities that are to the benefit of the least well-off people. But the question is, when does it have to be to the benefit? Right. And if we're actually talking about economic growth, so now we'll do a real world comparison about the kind of redistribution that a real government does, not exactly. not 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 a not a Rawlsian perfect person government, but a real government does, and the failures that incorporate that because these are people after all. Uh, then how does that compare against growth? Because what if your inequality? Is becomes a capital investment good that helps start a business which benefits the least representative people in 30 years. And in the real world, that's a better bet than betting on non-ideal government. Right. I completely agree. So again, this is sort of a Smithian point where I think, look, if you have people who are somewhat altruistic but probably largely self-interested, uh, what kind of institutional context does a better job of improving the condition of the poor? Like you said, relying on – Let's just say Donald Trump, relying on Donald Trump to help the poor. That's one option. Or you say, look, uh, I'm not under the illusion that people who are running Fortune 500 companies care about me, but Amazon has made me much wealthier. Again, maybe not because they care about me, but because they want my business. The way that they get my business is by making a ton of stuff available to me at affordable prices and delivering it right to my door, uh, driving down the costs of goods. And that's actually a great mechanism for poverty alleviation. So one thing that I, I'm always fascinated by, and I go into this just a little bit in the book, is data about uh, the time price of goods. So you say, OK, you have an American in, I don't know, 1985 or something like that, working at the uh, median American wage. Uh, how many hours do they have to work to buy 
a loaf of bread or a car or a T-shirt or something like that. And then you, t you take that same person in 2019 working the median American wage. How much time do they have to work to buy those goods? And it's plummeting. And that's really a great way to alleviate poverty is you say a person's labor hour just buys more stuff today than it did yesterday. It's not because, again, the people making bread care about the bread buyers. They want the bread buyers' money. But the way that they get that money – again, as Smith would say, is by offering them something that they want out of their own self-interest. So that would be like lower bread prices. Well, you quote Stephen Levitt saying, how rich you are depends on two things, how much money you have and how much the stuff you want to buy costs. Right. And redistributive justice seems to focus on how much money you have, but growth seems to focus more on how much the stuff you want to buy costs. Right. And that seems to work better overall in a world of imperfect human beings on both sides of the ledger. I think that's right. And I think also if you look at uh, even in recent history, you know, countries that have gotten richer, it's largely through market reforms. It's through economic growth. And I think the reason why, you know, the three of us sitting here would be considered rich in world historical terms is because we can get a, I don't know, cup of coffee and eight minutes of, I don't know, that's probably, you know, well, I guess it depends on where you buy it from. You get cheap coffee in like two minutes of, of labor time, basically. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, so so it's not so much redistribution. It's the quantity and quality of goods getting a lot better and the real price of goods plummeting. And that's really what growth addresses. And Rawls doesn't really talk about that very much. On the broader level, how much of a problem, though, is this for the whole of the Raw like the Rawlsian project, we have to jettison it? Because if if we have – if this whole thing starts with there's a set of principles that we're trying to advance and here's a decision-making mechanism for coming up with institutions that we think will advance them um, and and then these institutions, once they're set up, are tasked with advancing them, that a Rawlsian – so a lot of them would probably disagree with the empirical stuff that you've been offering but – but a Rawlsian could with perfectly easily say, well, OK then. So what you've just shown me is that capitalism in these ways helps and so now the institutions just redirect a bit in that way Well, also in those areas where we still have concerns like social safety nets and whatever, providing that kind of stuff um, and, and we're good. Like nothing – you haven't really knocked down my ideal theorizing. All that you've done is said when it comes time for me to take my ideals and start applying them, I've been doing it slightly wrong. Right. So if that was the response that I got, I would – I'd be happy. I'd be popping the, the champagne I think at that point. Uh, right. So I haven't done anything to argue against the Rawlsian at the level of first principle. So – Nothing I say in the book speaks against the idea that we should use the original position to arrive at first principles of justice. Doesn't say anything about whether or not the principles that Rawls himself arrived at are true or false. So the original position could be a great way of arriving at principles of justice. Rawls's principles could be totally correct. His first principles might be totally right. And if they say, look, I'm still a Rawlsian at first principle, but the concerns that you've raised have moved me towards classical liberalism at the level of institutional design. Uh, I, I would be very happy with that because that's that's really my aim. I mean, I have other problems with Rawls at the level of first principle that I don't get into here. But really, in the book, what I would like to say is, look, if you're a Rawlsian, at, at the at the absolute minimum, don't rule out classical liberalism or libertarianism as an institutional means to your ends. But that then seems to be slightly different from a broadside against ideal theory. Like so that's just saying your ideal theory, stick with ideal theory, but I mean we all have to just like we when we do moral theory, we talk about, you know, sets of moral principles or we talk about, you know, archetypal rules or we talk about perfect virtues, but at some point we have to actually act in the world and right. but that doesn't then just say well then we should stop talking about moral saints or what perfect virtue is. Right. But you seem to be more critical of ideal theory just in general. So I would distinguish between ideal theory at the level of institutional theorizing and ideal theory at the level of, I don't know, philosophizing or whatever we might call it. Principle establishing or something. Yeah, yeah. right. And, to, and John Tomasi in Free Market Fairness talks talks a bit about this distinction as well. But so I, I would say, look, um, so, so there are a couple of things we might mean by ideal theory. One is the basic stuff about the original position and the first principles of justice. That might be what we're thinking about in terms of ideal theory. I set that to the side. Another thing we could mean by ideal theory is this idea of uh, you know, what would institutions look like in a fully just society? I think to some extent that's still an interesting 
enterprise. Uh, so maybe what we're doing is theorizing about what the ideal anarchist order would be. Like, that's, I don't know. That's kind of cool. I don't know how much uh, cash value that has, but it's like a cool, I don't know, like, I, you know, as a philosopher, I'm not anyone to cast aspersions on uh, people who are theorizing about stuff that's not directly applicable to the real world. There would be so, a Bitcoin value in <laughs> anarchist society. That's right. and, and so that's fine. So really my main target when I'm worried about ideal theory is uh, the inconsistency in applying it when we're thinking about institutions. So you could go full on ideal theory, talk about the whether you're the anarcho-capitalist, whether you're the G.A. Cohen Marxist on a camping trip where you're, you know, uh, sh sharing uh, carrot peelers and, you know, singing Kumbaya or whatever. Uh, like, that's fine. The worry is that when you're doing this ideal theory, but selectively allowing non-ideal stuff in to justify a move away from anarchy towards the state. And I think, I mean, I think that's realistic. I think surely we live in a world that's not perfectly just. And so surely we have to allow non-ideal considerations in. But what we can't do is only let them in when we're talking about the market and civil society. If you let them in, you got to let them in everywhere. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible and Landry Ayers. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.